Good evening, everybody. Per our program, we should be starting dinner right now, and I should be done. But uh, obviously, we're running a little bit late, and the reason is that uh, we want to make sure everybody's here. Uh, Don Shelby will be coming after he completes his uh, 6 o'clock newscast and will be joining us as well. But other than that, it is really wonderful. We got a 100% turnout all the people who said they would be here, and thank you very much. I am really um, pleased to be here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank, thank all of you. Uh, without your support, your leadership, and your hard work, MMAF would not be in existence today. And it's something we can be very, very proud of. And I'll get ahead of my comments. And what we're doing here is really the best of Minnesota value in terms of saying thanks and recognizing and helping uh, those military members and combats from Minnesota uh, who have made the fact sacrifices in defense of freedom for us. So my purpose is to, in addition to saying welcome and thanks for being here, uh, and again, to repeat that you are our major supporters and donors and volunteers, and that um, you are in for a real treat tonight. A year ago, February, Tom Friedman volunteered and came here and helped us raise about a million dollars, and also through a crowd of 500. So you are in the select few who are invited here tonight. Thank you, Tom. We have the kind of the um, first insight to uh, what's on Tom's mind because he has been on uh, traveling the country, has been on his uh, book sabbatical, and he's just started res resume writing, so he's got so much on his mind in terms of what's critical to the future of this country, and we are the first, the first crowd to really uh, get that insight, and I think we're very, very fortunate, and Tom, the timing could not be better, and again, thank you. Let me... Uh, take this opportunity to give you a brief update on MMAF, the Minnesotans Military Appreciation Fund. The mission of MMAF is to raise and increase awareness of the sacrifices being made by our Minnesota military personnel in serving our country during this war and to say thank you uh, to these soldiers and to their family. And in addition to the awareness, we provide cash grants uh, to all the, those who served in combat. Minnesotans who have served in a combat zone since September 11, 2001, are eligible to receive a cash grant of $500 given to those who have served, $5,000 to given to the families of those killed in action, and between $2,000 and $10,000 is given to those injured, depending on the severity of the injury. I am proud to say that in less than three years, we officially launched our uh, mission or launched the um, the effort, MMAF, in August, uh, August 5th or so, 2005. I'm proud to say that during these three years, we raised over $6 million. Uh, we have provided more than 6,500 grants. And I should tell you that to my surprise, about one third of these grants are to reservists and to active military personnel, which is something that I had not expected because originally we thought those who really need the help are the citizen soldiers, but the reservists, I guess they're kind of the forgotten people, they're really citizen soldiers as well, but then an active, a number of active duty personnel. Our grants thus far total in excess of $4 million. Of these grants, the breakdowns are as follows. 35 went to the families of those soldiers killed in action, and unfortunately, I hate, hated to tell you, we're working on another 20 to those killed. So that means the number of Minnesotans killed in action with connection to our states exceed 55. So we're working with those family. We allowed a grieving period and then provide them with the grants as we help them uh, complete the application. 237 soldiers wounded of those Another 50 are applying for additional grants based on the severity of their injury. So uh, it is the needs out there, uh, the impacts, the severities have just been enormous and something that you and I kind of forget about when we go, go home every day. Now, our mission of saying thanks to Minnesotans serving our country has been enhanced by our, embraced by our great state. As I said earlier, we wouldn't be here without you, your support, and 
all the uh, wonderful uh, volunteer efforts of many of you. And as soldiers, we have many comments, and every time we provide you in our annual report, and I get in a, an occasion to talk about it, uh, we give you some of the letters and notes that we receive in our office here. But I can assure you that the impact has been enormous. In some cases, our grants help to meet financial needs. As I said, we receive messages, and here's one from the Sterlings of Ashley, Ashby, Minnesota. Anybody know where that is? Fergus Falls. Fergus Falls? Close to Fergus Falls. Yeah, you lived there, didn't you? As a kid. It's about 20 miles, 25 miles uh, south of Fergus Falls. Oh, wonderful. This is a message from a soldier at the Sterlings in Ashby, Minnesota, who wrote, Thank you for the fun uh, check. With a spouse being away and the income down as we have our own business that had to be put on hold, your check came at a good time, end quote. We've heard about MMAF grants and laboring soldiers to pay their mortgage, do needed repairs on their homes, or meet some other financial need. More often, however, and Dennis Schuster that has repeated this time and time again, and that is, it's the idea, the, the, the knowledge that their service is being recognized and being appreciated, unlike Vietnam or uh, a similar period. It's had a tremendous impact on the morale and spirits of our soldiers, and they said simply it feels good to be thanks. The Buckleys of Redwood Falls wrote that the message of thanks sent with the check meant more to their son than any dollar amount. Captain D Donovan from St. Joe, Minnesota, wrote to us in this letter that, and I quote, it is organizations like yours that truly keep our soldiers and their families going, keep them going during these challenging times, end quote. We have all seen how MMAF's grants raise public awareness of the sacrifices made by our soldiers. You all remember so, uh, so, uh, Lance Corporal Kyle Anderson, who was a state wrestling champion and who had his brain uh, shot out in Iraq. Uh, about four years ago, and we provided him with the first $10,000 grant. And uh, a great young man who is a fraction of what he was before Iraq. He was a state wrestling champion in 2003, and following to the tradition of his family, enlisted in the Marine Corps and became an outstanding marksman and was sent to Iraq. And the week before he was severely injured, he saved the life of his uh, squadron, I guess in this case, company commander from a roadside bomb, but his traumatic brain injury totally disabled him, and he retired on medical pay, $18,000 a year uh, for life, which is below the poverty level. We brought attention to his story, and others have joined in to help, and that's the amazing thing about this community. Others, when they realize what's happening, have stepped up, just as Tom has volunteered to come back and his contribution, not in an effort, but also monetary, is an example of the very best of Minnesota. He recently moved into a newly remodeled home, handicapped accessible home, courtesy of the Operation Dream Makeover team with the Parade of Homes Remodeling Showcase. In other words, a bunch of builders in this community recognized his needs and stepped up and remodeled their home so that he could live at least a handicapped accessible life. Another one, a double amputees, and some of you met him at the uh, donors event uh, at Fort Snelling uh, last summer, Sergeant Chrysler, another $10,000 grant recipient. This brave soldier, husband and father of two young boys is now adjusting to a life as a double amputees. And we've told his story and it's reassuring to see how others have also stepped up to help him build him a home as well. And that is really wonderful. And, and we're very, very proud to be part of this whole process. Sergeant Chrysler spoke in our donor recognition event this past July, and his closing words were in such that they touched me very, very deeply. And every time I go out and make a grant, I, I kind of really choke up, and you know, I'm usually pretty strong will and, and um, firm in my viewpoints, but I really choke up in these things. In response to my comment that I thought were making a difference, Sergeant Chrysler said, I can assure you, Mr. Sitt, that MMAF is making a difference." End quote. Future plans. 
MMAF hopes to continue its mission of thanks until the last Minnesota soldier comes home. And right now, we've worked out a strategic plan in terms of uh, based on the expected deployments of our troops, what we need to do to go forward. Here are some numbers that we found striking. One, more than 15,000 Minnesotans have served since 9-11-01. Two, we have uh, awarded over 6,500 grants, and we estimate that another 3,000 soldiers who returned who are now eligible for a grant from us. Three, at one time we were receiving 150 grant applications a week in our office, and now we're at a rate of about 50, which is good, but it's still way too high, but considering the deployment, as can be expected. As I mentioned, 50 uh, severely injured soldiers will be applying for additional grants above the $2,000 level, and that we're working on 25 grants to the families of those killed in action. There were 1,000 Minnesotan soldiers, guard members, recently deployed, and of course we don't even know about the reservists, don't have an exact number there and in the active duties. These soldiers will be eligible for grants from us, and we're told, and Major Fleming, who's out there, who uh, works in the guard's office, can give you more details, but we're told that another 1,500 Minnesotan guard members are scheduled to be deployed this year. And then our guard unit, has been told by DOD that they can expect 1,000 or 1,500 of our reservists and Guard members to be deployed uh, in the foreseeable future. We ran through these numbers and based on grant levels, we expect that we will need another $3 million on, on top of our current uh, cash balance, which is available to take care of the 3,000 we're expecting to apply in the following three years. I should say to you, this will if we're successful, this will bring our total uh, fundraising to about $9 million, and that 90 cents, up to now, 90 cents of every dollar we raise has been given as grant to, to soldiers, with all the other expenses being borne by volunteers, my families, and just a lot of good hard work on a lot of people, and we're very, very proud of that. So you can count on that your money is being uh, used in a place where it's the most helpful. This is a challenge ahead for us. With your support, I'm confident we'll be able to meet this challenge. In closing, I want to say you can join me in being proud of what we have done so far, what we have established, what we hope to continue to do. What we've done here has touched the lives of many people, and they're very appreciative. They're very appreciative of the recognition, the awareness, as well as the financial help. And I could go on and on. But what we're doing here represent the very best of what we brought up with, the values that we live with all these years. And, but it's a wonderful, what we do is small compared to this major sacrifices being made, being made by our military. So our mission cannot be underestimated. And with that, we will start dinner. And after dinner, we will proceed with our evening program. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Brad Lehrman. I'm on the steering committee of MMAF. Thank you all for being here and thank you for your unyielding support of this very, very fine organization. And thank you especially to the SIT family for their unwavering support of this really uniquely Minnesota organization. <laughs> I am here with the, with the honor of being a very good friend and St. Louis Park classmate of Tom Friedman. <laughs> so, yeah. And it, it's, it's really amazing because Tom is the best of the Minnesota sons and Minnesota natives. We're so proud of him. And We're very, very fortunate to have him here today. Tom is very much in demand, and his generosity of time and resources is, is beautiful, and it's a wonderful contribution. Just this week on May 5th, the Wall Street Journal listed Tom as the number two most influ influential business thinker in the United States. Number three was Bill Gates. 
<laughs> and, and I can guarantee you don't know number one. Because I didn't, Tom doesn't, so we don't know how we made the list. So Tom's, uh, you know, we're just saying number two tries harder. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Tom graduated from St. Louis Park High School and then has a very illustrious professional career. He went to Brandeis for undergraduate. He went to Oxford with a master's degree in Middle Eastern Studies and got his first job in journalism with UPI. And in 1981, he was hired by the New York Times. And the rest, as they say, is sort of history. He has had an amazing career as a three-time Pulitzer Prize winning correspondent. And I'm sure all of you are aware of his articles and, of course, his wonderful books. So introducing someone like Tom Friedman in Minnesota is like introducing sort of the 91 or 87 twins in the Metrodome. <laughs> it's not very hard. It's a pretty easy layup. But Tom has also written some beautiful, beautiful books, some amazingly thought-provoking books. And I'm sure the last one, I just was corrected by Tom earlier. I thought it sold 2 million copies, but it's actually been 4 million copies. The world is flat, is flat worldwide, including a half million in China. So an amazing accomplishment. Tom has been working and been on sabbatical uh, just into the last couple of weeks on his new book called Hot, Flat, and Crowded, which he'll give you a very brief preview of. And that's the great professional resume of Tom, and he's wonderful. But I think it's really important to give the personal touch as well because Tom and I got to know each other because our dads were good friends. Our dads used to golf together. Our dads used to bowl together. And we used to go and tag along with our fathers, sometimes caddy and sometimes bowling at the local bowling lane as our dads were somewhere down the line. And he signs all of my books now to my best bowling partner. <laughs> and Tom went on to become a very good golfer. He's an excellent golfer and I'm not. Uh, but I think I can bowl okay still. <laughs> Tom has truly some wonderful values, and, and the reason we're so proud of him and I'm so thankful to be his friend is that Tom really has a moral gyroscope that I think spins true to the Minnesota North Star. He remembers the values of family, of friendship, and of community, and we're very, very fortunate to have him as a Minnesota native son. Tom Friedman. Well, Brad, thank you very much. It's a treat to be here again uh, for MMAF. Uh, we were here, was it February? Uh, we did the dinner with uh, that uh, uh, Gene and his family so graciously um, uh, organized. And I told Brad I was going to be out here again this weekend. I'm here for, she brought in by Best Prep um, to do an event for them with a bunch of high school students today. And uh, I suggested, why don't we try to um, give another boost to MMAF since I'm going to be in town. And so, uh, Gene was immediately on the case, and um, <laughs> like a fly on butter, and um, it's, uh, and uh, so we're here tonight. Um, uh, I don't have any big lecture tonight. We're really going to do this as a Q and A. But uh, Brad mentioned that I have been working on a book, and I'll tell you just a little bit about that, and then we'll just kind of open the floor to a discussion. I've been on sabbatical for six months. Um, almost six months uh, working on the book. I just returned to my column uh, two weeks ago, and, um, and I'm back now um, uh, you know, in column full time and just finishing the book. The book, as Brad said, is called Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Um, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, Why We Need a Green Revolution and How It Can Revive America. Um, that's what the book is about. And um, the core uh, thesis of the book, um, is uh, basically that you know, I went and I wrote The World is Flat, and uh, I really thought that <clears throat> the central argument was that this technological revolution that was leveling the global economic playing field, allowing individuals to compete, connect, and collaborate uh, cheaper, deeper, um, uh, farther, faster than ever before. And I really thought, well, that is the framework, I really argued, that could explain more things going on in the world today, economically, socially, and politically than anything else. And um, uh, I did the 1.0 edition of that book, 2.0, 3.0 edition of the book. Um, as uh, Stephen Colbert said when I went on the Colbert Report, what's the matter, you couldn't get it right the first time? I said, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, um, and I kind of left that and I've been doing a lot of work on energy and environment for the last few years, really since 9-11. Um, 
And uh, I originally set out to write a book called Green is the New Red, White, and Blue. Um, and that was the original title of the book, which came from a documentary and a magazine piece that I had done. Um, and, uh, and, and basically what happened was in, in working on the book, in the very best sense of the term, I realized the book was about something else and literally called my publisher uh, in New York and said, uh, we have to change the title of the book. And because uh, really I discovered in the writing of the book that the most important thing I felt going on in the world today is actually a perfect storm of global warming, global flattening, and global crowding, uh, global population growth. And, um, and it was truly in, in writing the book that I realized that it was the intersection between these three things that is uh, driving five megatrends right now that I think are really shaping international relations, and they are climate, uh, global warming, climate change, energy supply and demand, or more broadly resources, uh, both energy and natural resources, supply and demand, um, petro-dictatorship, Russia, Venezuela, Iran, Nigeria, uh, biodiversity loss, and uh, something I call energy poverty. And uh, what the book really does is take these five problems and uh, analyzes each one deeply. The first half of the book is about that. And then the second half of the book is about the solution. Um, and uh, I basically outline what I think is the, uh, the only way that we can um, address all five of those problems at once and creates a big framework around them. But the book actually, although it masquerades as a book about energy and environment and biodiversity, and it's been a lot of fun because I've had to travel a lot of places, learn about a lot of things that I didn't know about, everything from how utilities work to um, you know, the uh, uh, rainforest in Sumatra, um, that it, as they brought, brought together all of these things. But while it, it masquerades as that, it's actually a book about America. Um, it's actually a book about my country. Um, it's actually a book about my own feeling that um, America has lost its groove. Uh, we've lost our groove since 9-11. Um, and uh, we need to get our groove back as a country. Um, and the sort of meta argument of the book is that what red was for our parents' generation, anti-communism, uh, this all-encompassing idea around which we built our uh, infrastructure, we built our roads, we built our highway system, we built our education system, what red was to America of the 1950s, green needs to be to America of the 21st century. And unfortunately, uh, I argue that President Bush, Bush took us from red to code red, um, and we need to go from red to code green. Uh, and the uh, book is about code green um, and what that means in terms of dealing with these problems and at the same time, I think, creating a platform for reviving our economy, our education system, our infrastructure, and the like. So that's what I've been up to for the last six months. And um, uh, with uh, that introduction, um, we can talk more about that and journalism and public affairs. And let's uh, open the floor. I'm going to ask Michael Gorman to come up with me. And Great. Take the middle, middle seat. Middle hot seat. Great. Meet the breast. Meet the breast. Exactly. You all have the great opportunity of now acting like Tim Russert <laughs> and asking the tough questions, or maybe Stephen Colbert. <laughs> yeah. that's, and that's, that's scary. It's, it is scary. So you have a great opportunity to ask some questions here of Tom. And I have some questions that I know Michael does, but we'd like to open it up to the floor first and, and give you an opportunity to have a dialogue with Tom. There may be microphones. There we go. Tell us about Hezbollah. What are their goals? What do they, what do they want to get done? What's the end game for Hezbollah? It's an important question. Um, I guess, you know, to back up, the, the context I'd put it in is that the, the kind of meta story in the Middle East today is a Cold War between the United States and Iran. That's what's going on in the Middle East today. We are fighting a shadow war, a Cold War with Iran. And as part of that Cold War, Iran has a very sophisticated uh, regional strategy. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. Um, and uh, the regional strategy to create deterrence um, is to build up groups like Hamas in Gaza, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, the Sudaris in Iraq, basically, 
And all of these groups are really satellites based on Shiite communities in, in Lebanon and Iraq. In the case of Hamas, it's actually a Sunni community. Um, and they are basically Iran's kind of forward strategic um, uh, bases in the region. And they can turn up and down the volume. Now in, on the Arab-Israeli front, on the Lebanon-Israeli front, inside Lebanon, inside Iraq, as they like. And that's basically what's going on. We're, we're shadow boxing with them, uh, basically. And the problem we have, um, the, the, the challenge is, you know, if you don't want to be in the Middle East, and there's good reason not to want to be there, um, frankly, anymore, you know what I mean? Um, then, um, then you kind of shouldn't be there. But the dangerous thing is to be there and to kind of have your generals and diplomats giving press conferences saying the Iranians are doing these really bad things, you know what I mean? And neither being willing to negotiate with them or able to deter them. And that's kind of the situation we're in right now. We, we have a position of don't negotiate with them, but we don't have the leverage to actually deter them in an effective way. And so there's been a kind of silly debate between Obama and Mrs. Clinton, basically saying, you know, uh, she says, you know, you got to be tough, and he says, you got to talk to them. It's not talk or not talk. It's leverage or no leverage. And if you don't have leverage, you know, never sit down to a negotiating table that you can't get up from, you know. Uh, and so we have no leverage right now. And, you know, one of the reasons, you know, I've been arguing we need to set a date for two years now that we just got to get out of Iraq. People say, well, Iran will win. To which I say, what is second prize? You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. uh, what will you win? You'll win responsibility for Iraq. You will win um, the fact that, see, while we are, as long as we are in Iraq, we do two things that Iran, Iran has two nightmares. One is that we succeed in Iraq, and the other is that we leave Iraq. What is their dream is we sit there exactly as we're doing. Because when we sit there, exactly as we're doing, we're in missile range of their forces, so they can hit us if we were to hit them. And at the same time, we soak up all the natural antagonism between Iraqi Shiite Arabs and Iranian Persian Arabs. Mm -hmm. Now I have 1,400 years of history that says these people do not play well together. <laughs> okay, <laughs> But because we, the outsider, are there, we become the pole the lightning rod that soaks up all that antipathy. Now, the minute we leave, Iran wins. What does that mean? It means they become the regional hegemon. Well, one thing we know about Iraq, OK, whoever is the hegemon you know, is going to induce enormous opposition. And so the Iranians are terrified, as they say, that we should succeed, that we'd actually produce a real Shiite democracy, as opposed to the phony one in Iran, or that we leave. And so we got to decide. Either you're going to make this thing work, um, or you're going to leave. Or maybe threatening to leave is what will make it work. <laughs> but just sitting there, like we're doing, makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, uh, not at the strategic level, and not at the Iraq level. Um, it's a huge example of moral hazard, of just like we've done in the banking system, of, of basically giving Iraqis a free check to kind of do what they want, without ever saying, look, you know, this can't go on the way it's going on. So, so that's kind of how I see, uh, see the whole thing. Michael, you've worked hard. Well, there may be, uh, there are some hands out here. I'd be happy to ask Please, questions. Please, someone's got a microphone. Yes. Uh, my question relates to the larger issue, the context of war and peace. Mm -hmm. It relates to the cultural setting in the Middle East, and I need to preface the question with the, this quotation. Golda Meir once said, we will not have peace with the Arabs until they love their children more than they hate us. Mm -hmm. Recently, we've seen on television Farfur, Mickey Mouse's evil twin. Mm -hmm. He is a cartoon character, Sesame Street kind of character. He exhorts his children's, the audience of children, on Palestinian television to become Shahid, martyrs. Mm -hmm. So my question to you within that context is, is that trend reversible? If so, what can we do in the West to help reverse that trend? If it's not reversible, what are the implications? It's a very good question, and it's an important question. So I'm, I'm going to give you a very a little long-winded answer. Um, and it, it has to do with my own 
intellectual journey uh, on this question. Do we have time? You have a few minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> We've got time. So, you know, uh, as, uh, as all my readers know, uh, you know, I, I supported the Iraq War, okay? Um, but for my own reason, it had nothing to do with WMD. In fact, I wrote before the war, there is no WMD, and if you're going to Iraq for WMD, don't go. I wrote, a, I wrote a column before the war called Tell the Truth. It's not about WMD. At least it wasn't for me. It wasn't about oil either, about your question. Um, now, the lesson I've learned is you can't fight your own war. Okay. So shame on me, but that's another issue. But you should know that I wasn't just throwing darts here. I looked at the Middle East after 9-11, and my analysis was very simple. We've treated the Middle East for the last 50 years, we Republicans and Democrats, as a, as a collection of big, dumb gas stations. Uh, there was the Kuwaiti station, the Libya station, the Algeria station, the Saudi station, the Iran station, the Iraq station. And we basically said to them, we said, guys, because it was only guys. We said, guys, here's the deal. You keep your pumps open, your price is low. And don't bother the Jews too much. Don't bother the Israelis too much. And you can do whatever you want out back. You can treat your women however you want. You can preach whatever hate from your mosque to infidels, Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, Shiites that you like. You can print whatever crazy conspiracy theories in your newspapers that you like. You can educate or miseducate or uneducate your kids as much as you want. And you can deprive your people of whatever civil rights you want for as long as you want. Just keep the pump open, the price low, and don't bother, don't bother the Yehudis too much. <laughs> okay. That was our policy for 50 years. And it was my view then, and it's still my view today, that Osama bin Laden represented the distilled essence of everything that was going on out back. Okay. That's what he represented. So my view was um, basically, you can deal with the terrorists by any number of security or police means, but you cannot deal with terrorism unless you got at really the underlying problem, which is the absence of any kind of social contract and consensual governance in that part of the world. So I struggled mightily, believe me, over the Iraq War. Anyone who read my columns before couldn't even make sense of them, because I couldn't make sense of them, because I could have gone either way. I lived in Beirut for five years. I lived through one of these things. And I told everyone, look, I'm for the war 52. 5249. They say, wait, a 5249 doesn't add up. I said, I know it doesn't add up. Because for me, what it was about was that if you could actually, people said, Iraq, why don't you go to Saudi Arabia? Iraq's the wrong place. No, no, Iraq's exactly the right place. Why is that? Because if you could actually get what we were trying to do in a crazy and maladroit way, if you could actually get the constituent elements of one Arab country, Shiites, Sunnis, Kurds, Turkmen, to do something that has never been done before in that part of the world, write their own social contract, look each other in the eye, agree on the rules. This is a part of the world that has only known top-down monologues, never a horizontal dialogue. Top-down monologues from colonial powers, kings, and dictators. If they could actually have a horizontal dialogue where the constituent elements of one of these countries could actually work out a social contract rather than I'm either in power or I'm dead, um, which is the social contract in the Arab world, um, that if you could do that, hope for a different kind of politics that doesn't produce the Osama bin Ladens in the world as possible. So people said, how will you know if you're successful? And my answer was directly related to your question. You know what I'd say? I'd say, I'll know we've been successful if Salman Rushdie can give a lecture in Baghdad. <laughs> that was my criteria. What was that about? What that was about is that Islam as a faith is struggling with modernity. It needs a reformation. 
How did the Reformation happen in Europe under Martin Luther? It happened when princes basically created a space for Martin Luther, for reformers to speak their mind, to raise reform. So the only way you're going to get that craziness out of, you know, uh, out of the region and out of the faith is if Muslims themselves work it out, talk it out. But it had to be, they had to have a space to do that in the heart of their world. Not here in Minnesota. Not have a cross-cultural dialogue here. We don't need that. Not in Europe, not Euro-Islam. Had to be in the heart of their world. So something very important was at stake here. The problem is we can't talk about it now. If you're for the war, you should shut up and die. Mm -hmm. If you're against the war, you're a genius. But the thing itself, we can't talk about. So I can't have this dialogue. I, if I write a column like this, there'll be, I, there'll be a my, uh, there'll be so many blog darts coming at me from so many different directions. Not that I care, but I'm just saying, after a while, you just get tired of it. But something really serious was at stake. Now, we have a president who can never articulate this. So he could actually never explain to the American people what's going on. So there's actually something very important going on. Because the bad guys out there understand if they can defeat us in the heart of their world, oh, that will have huge resonance. That's why there's no terrorism here. Oh, it's sure it's, it's post 9-11 and Homeland Security and it's all that stuff for sure. And if your name is Mohammed and you're 18 years old and you haven't seen Disney World yet, you're too late, pal, okay? <laughs> but um, there's, there's all of that. But much more importantly, they're not focused on here. They're not focused on anyone can set off a bomb in Las Vegas. They want to defeat us in the heart of their world. Conversely, if we were to defeat them in the heart of their world, in collaboration with other Arabs and Muslims, the defeat would be devastating. Okay? So something really important is at stake here. But no one can talk about it. You cannot talk about Iraq anymore. If you're for the war, shut up and die. If you are against it, you're a genius. That is the whole level of the discussion now. And so Obama was against it in his high school student council, or wherever he voted against it, and Hillary was for it. And meanwhile, nobody can actually talk about the issue you've raised, the thing itself. Can, I'd just like to follow on that for a moment before we go to another question, because when a person of your uh, uh, stature and your uh, bully pulpit makes a, f a statement that we can't talk about something, I think we should all be deeply, yeah, deeply concerned. Bad. Can you comment on the unique uh, set of perspectives you collect playing this role of trying to navigate and not trying to be an ideologue on one side of, of any debate or another, but trying to speak to the truth as you see it, on the state of discourse in this country as you see it, and uh, the path to a more sophisticated, uh, nuanced is the wrong word, but uh, a more open dialogue about the hard topics, because it's very discouraging for you to say, yeah. I can't talk about it. Well, I can't talk about it, and I do. In fairness, I'm exaggerating, but I, and I have talked about it a plenty. Just after a while, you get tired of beating your head against the wall. It's very hard. It's very hard. not easy to be a public figure in, in this country anymore. You know what I mean? It's, I love the blogosphere, because I think it's great to have a space where, where people, um, first of all, you get all this diversity of voices. There's some wonderful voices that have been unleashed there. I think it's a great space at one level. At the other level, the discussion in the blogosphere, if you'll pardon me, starts with asshole and then moves up. Okay, and that, okay that's, that's like clearing your voice. Okay? It's just like, that's just uh, clearing your throat. Okay? And so the level of discussion um, is so violent and vile, basically, that you don't go there. Only dragons live there if you are like me. I mean, I would, I would rather drink a gallon of castor oil than put my name into Google and see the razor blades, broken bottles, and rusty cans that would come up. Okay, My Wikipedia profile is a freak show Okay, that basically has been taken over by my critics. And um, uh, it's like, it's really bizarre, you know. So it's a very strange thing to be a public figure in this country today. I mean, in the, in the sense of debate. 
Um, but uh, that's one of the problems. That, so I've tried to occupy a place at the New York Times. And I, I don't do this consciously. But it's very important for me to have conservative readers and liberal readers. I, I want people to read me. The, uh, and the reason I am the way I am is enormous. There's an enormous amount of Minnesota in me. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I come from a place where politics works, or worked, mm -hmm. at least when I grew up. Mm -hmm. okay? And um, uh, you know, I come from a place of Gene McCarthy and Mondale and Humphrey and all these people and Don Fraser. That was the Minnesota I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And uh, Arnie Carlson. And mm -hmm. um, I, you know, so I come from a place, a community that worked, a very diverse community. It was all white, but it was diverse in its own way, mm -hmm. you know. And um, so I brought that optimism time to the world. And it, it, I actually wrote my column this Sunday about my mother because um, it's Mother's Day and my mom passed away last month. So. Um, and uh, one of the things I, uh, points I made was that one of the things my mother really gave, my mother was the most uncynical person in the world. I mean, just very optimistic person. So I bring that optimism to the world, but it can get you in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, it can really get you in trouble because you, if you believe, God, if we try this, maybe people's better angels will come out, you know, whatnot. So, you know, I, I do try to write in a way, in a voice. I don't do cynicism, and I don't tear people apart except the president. <laughs> um, uh, but no, I, I, any president, because I believe that if you're president, you're, you know, that's a different thing. But I don't go after people personally, because I know what it's like to be gone after. And I can't imagine what it would be like to be gone after by me in the New York Times. So, okay. <laughs> so um, I don't go after people personally, because my belief is pick on someone your own size. Okay. So um, uh, that's, that's my approach. I try to write in a way that everyone will read. The best thing anyone ever says to me is, I read your column. I don't always agree with you, but I read your column. You know? mm -hmm. Now, every column you try to, as a columnist, I've really learned that young people come to me and say, I want to be a columnist. What do I do? And I say, look, every column has to produce one of five reactions. You want a column to produce one of five reactions. First is, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. If you write a column, someone says, I didn't know that. That's a good reaction. Second is, um, I never looked at it that way. Mm -hmm. Oh, if someone says, I, you, I gave you a new perspective. I never looked at it that way. Third, your, fav <laughs> your favorite. Happens only two or three times a year. You said exactly what I feel. <laughs> Bless your heart. Oh, God, I just could love you for that. The fourth is, I want to kill you dead, you and all your offspring. <laughs> <laughs> because if your column is defined as much by people who are for it as who are against it, and if people aren't against you, mm -hmm. it means you're not taking a position. And the last is, you made me laugh, you made me cry. <laughs> okay. One of those two. So if you write one of those five things, you've got a successful column. And so I try to operate in that, in that space. Um, We're grateful for your optimism. I appreciate that. Thank you. Comment? Rudy. Um, uh, I read I read your column and I don't always agree with That's bless you. <laughs> My favorite. <laughs> My favorite. I read your book and I enjoyed it very, very much. Thanks. Uh, and uh, I, I'd like to know the impact of the flatness of the world, of the ubiquity of, of the information that goes around. What will that, how will that impact the Middle East? Uh, will that information get to the Iranians? It's a good question, Rudy, and, and, and you really see, again, uh, the flat world is everything in its opposite. And so everything that has a positive trend also has a negative trend. So on the one hand, you have more, you know, there are like 4,500 extremist Islamist websites in the world today. So if you're a young person and that is your bent and that is your orientation, you have no problem going on the web and finding a smorgasbord of uh, ideologues and ideologies preaching hate against any number of groups. On the converse, Iran has more bloggers per capita than any country in the world today. Iran. Iran is a huge number, a huge blogging community. And so they're being empowered. Um, they know what's going on. When the world is flat, boy, that's one good thing. You can see just where the caravan is and just how far behind you are. Okay, that's what happens when the world gets flat. And so it's acting on these places as well. 
And if you, could, if you ask me, Rudy, OK, what is plan B on Iraq? My plan B is get out, do everything we can to bring down the price of oil by inventing alternatives, not by giving a gas tax holiday, and then let globalization work its magic. Because people don't change when you tell them they should. They change when they tell themselves they must. And any parent knows that. And um, that part of the world will change when people tell themselves they must. And that will only happen when the price of oil goes from 120 back to 30 or $40 a barrel. Um, and as I show in my book, one of the, I have a chapter called Filler Up with Dictators. And um, uh, I have what I call the first law of petropolitics. I invented this. Um, and I basically show how the price of oil and the pace of freedom operate in an inverse correlation. Mm -hmm. As the price of oil goes up, the pace of freedom goes down. As the price of oil goes down, the pace of freedom goes up. So when Iran, when oil was $25 a barrel, Iran elected Khatami as president, who called for a dialogue of civilizations. At $70, they elected Ahmadinejad, who said the Holocaust is a myth. Friedman's second rule of petropolitics is at $25 a barrel, the Holocaust is never a myth. That's only nonsense you can afford at $70 a barrel. So you bring the price of oil down. You know, with all due respect to Ronald Reagan, it was, people forget, the day the Soviet Union collapsed in December of 1991, the price of oil cratered. It was about $16 a barrel. Um, and uh, I gave a lecture in Moscow last year for the US Embassy. And they had a whole group of uh, uh, Russian economists there. And one of the points I made, I went through this, and I made the point that it was $10 a barrel oil that brought down the Soviet Union. People forget the Soviet Union was the second largest oil producer in the world after Saudi Arabia. And after the, I got done and I went up to Vladimir Mao, who runs one of the top economic institutes in Moscow, I said, Vladimir, I'm right. It was $10 barrel oil that brought down the Soviet Union. He said, no, Tom, you're wrong. It was $80 barrel oil followed by $10 barrel oil mm. that brought down the Soviet mm. Union. $80 barrel oil suckered the Soviet Union into extending subsidies and the state into all these areas. Mm. And then when $10 barrel oil came, the state had to pull out from all these things. Subsidies here, subsidies there, and the whole thing just crashed. Iran, I, you can bet the wife and kids on it. The same thing would happen in Iran, uh, where gasoline is 39 cents a gallon all subsidized, subsidized mortgages, subsidized housing. You pull down the price of oil, the whole house of cards will collapse. And unfortunately, right now, you know, no one wants to do the hard but effective thing. Let's bring down the price of oil. Rather, we ask our neighbors and the people MMAF support to go off and fight a war in Iraq, you know, or keep fighting a war that is not going to produce the results we need. So to me, it's get out of Iraq bring down the price of oil, and let globalization do its thing. And those three things together, I think, will maybe get us that reform process, to go back to that question, that we're certainly not going to get. You know, with $120 barrel oil, do you know how much corruption is going on in Iraq today? The whole fight in Iraq is all over money. It's over who gets the oil tap. That's all it's about. And um, you're, not, you're just going to have another corrupt petro uh, petrocracy, if it, even if it's uh, not a dictatorship. So that's my two cents. Uh, Tom, have, have you read any of the stuff by the Peruvian economist uh, Hernando and de Soto? Soto. Yeah, yeah, it's a and of yeah. and uh, he took on Shining Path mm -hmm. it, 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 and uh, made the fertile ground that was in Peru sort of barren. Mm -hmm. Now, he, I mean, Fujimori really took on Shining Path, but uh, would he have? Uh, and, and his he's actually worked, on, Hernando's worked in Cairo, and he's tried to bring his ideas actually to the Middle East a little bit. Uh, his thesis is uh, uh, private property rights right. and, and protecting that. And, and uh, uh, would that have any have any uh, uh, particular? Uh, uh, you know, I think it's it's definitely part of the solution. I don't know um, uh, to what extent the private property issues are same in in the Middle East as they are in in, uh, in Peru. I know that he has worked in Cairo. Um, you know, the problem in the Middle East is, though related to that, it's, it's you have all these sitting around guys. You know, you just have a huge number of young people sitting around. And they go to the mosque, 
and the mosque leader says, you have a problem, and I can tell you exactly who your problem is, it's Americans and Jews. They are why you're sitting around, whatever it is, you know. And um, unemployment is rampant. They have a huge youth bubble. You know, half of Saudi Arabia is under 15. They have no way to create jobs for them because you have no kind of modern education going on. And so, um, you know, I call it the wheel of bin Laden. It starts with dictatorship right here. And what the dictators do, because they have no legitimacy from a consensual election, so what they do is they make deals with the old religious establishment. The religious establishment blesses the regime, and the regime then blesses them with state title and basically salaries and subsidies. Those religious leaders then ensure that the education system remains retarded. The retarded education system produces young people who are just sitting around. That makes them angry, and the wheel of bin Laden just goes around and around. Mm. And that's what we were facing after 9-11. So uh, I, I didn't, you know, I took the view after 9-11, some things are true even if George Bush believes them. And, um, you know, and, uh, um, and, and one of them is, one of them is you had to break that wheel. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we didn't do it the best way we could have. And we made a lot of mistakes. But at the end of the day, it was their world. And they really blew it. You know, if you were a Martian and you came to Earth now, and you said, hey, I'm in Iraq, uh, tell me what happened here. Well, there's this country called America that came over and decided to spend a trillion dollars getting rid of the dictator who was running this country into a ditch for attacking all his neighbors and killing the Shiites and whatnot. And um, they came over, they said they'd like to spend a trillion dollars of their money to try to fix this country. And these people said, no, 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 we'd rather keep fighting. In fact, now that we've gotten rid of the dictator, we'd like to prosecute a religious war over who is the proper successor to the prophet Muhammad in 684 um, AD. And after a while, you have to say, as I do, you know what? You have a problem, OK? <laughs> um, you people can't get along with each other. And that is a problem. Do you know what you're fighting over? I mean, you know, and after a while, you just have to say, um, uh, I can't help you. I really, shame on me, you know, I really thought, you know, maybe we could create the context for a social contract, but, but you have a problem, and you're going to have to work that out on your own. And I, you know, signed up for midwifing democracy, not babysitting a civil war. And we've gone from midwife to babysitter, and to ask our young people to go there, get hurt and injured, so this group has to help pay their medical bills to babysit a civil war is shameful, in my view, at this stage in the game. Because we are, we are, you know, that's okay, I'm not, not crossfire, I appreciate the thought, but it's, you know, we are, every, we are fighting, you know, for our view of Iraq is everyone's second choice there, okay? We want a pluralistic democracy, but Shiites want a Shiite-dominated country, the Sunnis want the old regime, the Kurds want independence, and our idea of Iraq is everybody's second choice. We have our first choice kids dying for their second choice. That is not tolerable, in my view. So that's where I, that's my own journey. That's where I've come. Tom, I'd like to shift the focus a little bit more Good. to the domestic economy. <laughs> and certainly the dependence on foreign energy has created a lot of these, these ills that you've talked about. But the question I'm asking is, what can we do uh, internally here in this country I mean, the alternative energy is going to require a change of lifestyle. And um, I'm with a large public company. And what company? I'm, pardon? What uh, company? Super Value. It's oh, a right. supermarket company. Well, I know. And uh, we're really on an effort now to get our employees to be sensitive to uh, uh, environmental sustainability. I mean, printing on both sides of paper, no styrofoam cups. We're uh, we're the second largest supermarket chain in the country, so oh, we're great. a huge energy user and other things. And we're really focused a lot on doing that. But uh, so much of it is lifestyle and getting people to change the way they think. And while large public companies can, can, can do part of this, it's going to take leadership beyond them. And where is that going to come from? Well, you, you know, it can only come, obviously, from a green president. You know, I mean, it's got to start there. Um, more than a black president or a red president or a white president, we are a woman president, we need a green president, you know. 
And um, you know, I, I, you know, this gets very more technical than we need to get into here in in, uh, in the book. But um, you know, everyone says we need a Manhattan Project. No, no, we don't need a Manhattan. We actually just need a market. We have no energy market, renewable energy market in this country, um, because to have a real energy market, you need a price signal. Okay. Um, why do you need a price signal? Uh, why do you need a um, a, a tax on carbon or a tax on gasoline and whatnot. Um, because energy is very different when it comes to innovation. What's your name, if I could ask? Uh, Dave Bayman. Dave. So uh, I can explain it to you this way. What my, my tutor on this is uh, Nate Lewis, who teaches energy chemistry at Caltech. And Nate was one of the huge helpers on my book. Um, and he's one of these great physicists or uh, chemists who can explain things to idiots like me. So. Um, uh, it's, it's enormously helpful to have people like that. So say I invented the first cell phone. I invented a phone you could carry in your pocket. I came to you, Dave. I said, Dave, I've got a phone you can carry in your pocket. You'd say, a, a, a phone? I could carry in my pocket? Yeah, that's right. phone you can carry. You'd say, Tom, I'll take 10. I'd say, Dave, wait a minute. These phones are going to cost you $1,000 each. say, Tom, a phone I could carry in my pocket would change my life. So I'll tend to you, tend to Brad, tend to Arnie, tend to Gene. Six months later, I come back and say, Dave, remember that phone I sold you, $1,000? It's now only $750. A little smaller, a little lighter. <laughs> okay? I'm down. You'll take 20 <laughs> Now I'm on a roll. A year later, I come back and say, Dave, remember that phone I sold you? Little thing, cell phone? Worked out pretty well for you, right? You say, Tom, changed my life. You say, great. Got another deal for you now. See that light there? I'm going to power that light with solar energy. But Dave, it's, uh, it's going to cost you $125 more a month to have solar-powered light. What would you say? You'd say, Tom, remember that phone you sold me? That changed my life. In case you haven't noticed, I already have light. <laughs> and I really don't care where the electrons come from. So unless, see, I'm, not, I'm just offering you the same thing. I'm not offering you a new function. I'm not offering you to go from a typewriter to the internet. I'm just offering you the same function. So unless the US government comes in and says, Dave, from now on, see that light there? You're not going to pay for all the externalities of that light, the CO2 it puts in the atmosphere, the pollution it puts in the air, and the troops it sends to the Middle East. From now on, that light's going to cost you $150 more a month. You're on the phone in a minute. Tom, remember that $125 <laughs> solar light? OK? And you'd be saying, Tom, I'll take 10. So unless you have a price signal, and then of course, once you buy 10, Brad buys 10, everybody buys 10, I'm down the cost volume curve, and six months I'm back and it's only $75. So unless the government is ready to create a price signal around energy, you cannot get scale for the alternatives. And this is a scale problem. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a huge issue. And like I said, we're one of the largest power consumers in the country because of all the refrigeration. Sure. In, in one of the areas I'm responsible for is stores, and we've seen significant jumps in utility just in the last 30 days, Massachusetts and Virginia particularly. But, you know, our whole financial modeling is starting to change now. You haven't Meaning, seen anything yet because what's yeah. going to happen? Well, that's what yeah. I keep saying. And yeah. in, in California now, uh, we, have, we have a large presence there, and we're just now starting to put photoelectric cells yeah. on the stores. But you need, you're not going to be able to do this with cheap energy. You know, you got to believe that costs are going to continue exactly. to go up to justify it. So it's a little bit of, I mean, alternative fuels or alternative energy is the answer. But unfortunately, it's also going to change our standard of living and our lifestyle and really to make it Well, work. you know, again, it, it, it can and it will. Um, but we haven't even done the easy stuff yet. Like, what if we went back to driving 55 miles an hour? The DOE says that could save millions of barrels of oil. Would that really change our lifestyle? Actually, we'd all be safer. We'd probably all live longer. More of us would drive small cars. I and mean, that's just a small thing, but that, that is actually a huge change. I mean, we actually haven't even done the easy stuff yet. Um, and so you know, I, I still think there's a lot you know, to be done. But there is going to be a change. Um, there is no question. What's going on now, what's really going on in the country, see, we're delegitimizing coal. Somebody comes along and says, I want to build a coal plant out here in suburban you know, Twin Cities. Good luck. You'll, you'll, Sierra Club will sue your ass off, you know, for mm -hmm. the next ten years. Yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll, your chance of getting that coal plant up are zippo. Okay, 
So we're delegitimizing coal, but we have not legitimized the alternatives. So actually what's happening, we're filling that all in with natural gas. Okay? Now we're importing more and we're using more of our own natural gas, which actually should be used for fertilizer and industrial purposes. We're just burning it. Okay? So I'm trying to figure out how I can buy natural gas, because as sure as I'm sitting here, the price of natural gas has to go up, because we're delegitimizing coal, but we're not empowering the alternative. And you're going to see a huge spike in natural gas prices as a result of this. So, um, but the problem is we, I mean, this gets deep in our, but you know, you, you have to have a systems approach to this kind of problem. If you're just doing corn ethanol in the Midwest, that is the epitome. It's the definition of asystematic. I hope I'm not in, insulting anybody here, but you know, that's the definition. You know, Ken Boulding, an economist, says how do you, something asystematic, that's doing something really well you shouldn't be doing at all. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right? That's what, that's corn ethanol, um, in my view. So um, <laughs> doing something really well you shouldn't be doing at all. And um, you need a systems approach. So for that, you need. Um, we need someone running the country like you're running Super Value. See, what happened at Super Value, I don't know anything about your company, but here's what I bet happened. They were there for years. The person who bought products, okay, and the person who paid the energy bills were two different people, okay? So the person who bought the product, they just wanted to maximize their budget, buy the cheapest thing, didn't care at all what the energy implications were. And suddenly you woke up one morning and said, mm, we need a CEO, a chief energy officer, who, mm -hmm. who looks at things from a holistic point of view, a total cost basis of energy, and then you start making totally different decisions. And that's the transition the country's going through now. We're just in the beginning of it, though. Wonderful. Other questions? <laughs> Tom. Yeah. Um, well, why wouldn't you consider nuclear? Not a single person. Oh, I'm all for nuclear. I'm, 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 I'm don't, don't know, exactly. don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, whatever, you know, whatever can be done in a cost-effective way that's clean, I'm for. And nuclear is definitely uh, would be part of my. Alternative uh, energy is great, yeah. but uh, it's going to be. Yeah, and if you want scale, you. To me, yeah, I talk about that in my book. Nuclear has got to be part of any any future. Um, you know, people are looking for oil and gas all over the place at $125 a barrel. Right. You could, they're digging in their backyard. Right. And stuff. Absolutely. That's going to help a lot. Yeah, that will. Yeah. At the margin. Right. At the margin, it'll, it'll probably. I, it, there's a lot of speculation in this price too. I think people are buying oil instead of gold. Um, I mean, there's lots of financial uh, speculation, I'm sure Gene can tell you, you know, where, where people are just buying contracts as a hedge against the dollar. So that's also going on. Great. Uh, can, you, can you help us understand uh, how flat China is in this world, and particularly its role in uh, continents like Africa and places where there are a lot of undeveloped? Sure. Yeah, well, you know, China has just a huge um, appetite. It's a monster truck with the gas pedal stuck, and they've lost the key, you know, basically. Um, and it just has a ravenous uh, energy appetite. And, um, uh, and, and they're certainly, you know, uh, their footprint is all over the world. Now, you know, on one hand, who, is, who are we to tell them, you know, that uh, we who have, you know, exploited Latin America, exploited Africa, Exploited in the economic sense, and not in the necessarily the colonial sense, whatever. Uh, that now it's not, you can't do that. You, you, no, it's not, not fair, it's not good, you know. Um, after we took down most of the trees, you can't take down the last few, you know. So I find that's not a very good discussion to have with them. So um, I actually was the speaker this year at the China Clean Car Conference in Tianjin last September. I was the closing speaker. It's great, it was a gas, actually. Um, Tianjin's kind of there, Detroit, this kind of grimy industrial city. It's about two hours south of Beijing. And I go down there, it's in the Marriott Tianjin, sort of seedy Marriott, it's all these Chinese car guys. And I'm the last speaker. And it's all guys, you know. And, um, and none of them speak a lick of English. They're all listening to me on headsets. And um, I got up and my speech was the following. I said, um, uh, every time I come here, young Chinese say to me, very rightfully, Mr. Friedman, you guys grew dirty for 150 years. You put most of the CO2 in the atmosphere. Now it's our turn. And I said, on behalf of all Americans, I'm here to tell you, it's your turn. Take your time. Because I think I just need five years to invent all the clean power technologies you're going to need as you choke to death. And I'm going to sell them all to you. 
and then we're going to clean your clock. I don't know how you say that in Chinese. <laughs> in the, we're going to clean your clock in the next great global industry. That's when I saw all the headsets going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, they're very smart. It took them about five seconds to figure it out. Yeah, and they knew just what I was saying. And I see this all over China now. You're seeing China go into clean power. Every mayor is looking to do it. They're going to be formidable competitors. They have to, OK? Because they can't go scouring the world for every last you know, piece of ore or, or energy or gas. That's not good for them, not good for us. There was a protest last week in China, if you saw, where people took to the streets to protest a chemical, petrochemical plant coming in. So their own people don't want to live that way. So clean power is going to be the next great global industry. I know that for sure. I just don't know who's going to lead it, them or us. And what I was trying to say is, you know, that's the race we need. You know, we in the Soviets had the space race. We in China need to have the Earth race. Okay, um, and I think that's going to be the next uh, the next great competition. And I would love to see that competition with China, where we both try to leapfrog each other and the EU, where we each try to what I call outgreen each other. Um, and outgreen is going to become a verb. Um, Take two more questions. Sure. Uh, We'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, something you touched on briefly earlier, is the rising cost of food in America mm -hmm. and the implication of, of, uh, of um, uh, the scarcity of rice and, 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 and grains in other parts sure. of the world, what, what the implications of the global economy will be. Well, you know, this is, this is what happens when flat meets crowded, um, basically. This is flat meeting crowded. Um, you know, you go to India today, and, and uh, I have a quote from Larry Brilliant, who runs Google.org, and Larry was... Uh, ran the polio eradication program in India. He says, you know, you go to Indian parents, you say, your kids, they're going to be vegetarians. Oh, yeah, my kid's going to be a vegetarian. Go to the kids, you say, you're going to be vegetarians. They say, I'm eating McDonald's, pal. <laughs> I'm not going to be no vegetarian. <laughs> and um, so, you know, when crowded meets flat, okay, you get these rising incomes and people uh, eating a lot more protein and just totally different diets, and you scale that globally. Uh, you're gonna, this is the implication of it. Now, fortunately, we're very efficient. Markets will catch up with this, as the gentleman over here suggested. More land will be planted, but that will have huge biodiversity implications. You know, um, so uh, this is a real problem. This is not just a momentary thing. I, I, I don't think. I don't know how it's all going to play out. It's not just a biofuel story that we're taking corn off the, you know, uh, off the market to make biofuels. But when when flat meets crowded. Um, uh, things get really, you get the law of large numbers working. Um, it, it's really going to have all kinds of effect. It's the same effect that the baby boom generation had on America. You're going to see now globally, basically, as this whole cohort comes in. Um, you know, my chapter on this in the book is called Too Many Americans Are Carbon Copies. Uh, because we, we grew up. I mean, well, let's, let's look at crowded. If you go to Google, you put in your birthday, you can find out how many people were on the planet the day you were born. So I was born July 20, 1953. Put that into Google, hit search, up comes uh, InfoWeek or InfoMag, whatever. It says there are 2.681 2 billion people on the planet the year I was born, July 20, 1953. Uh, God willing, I'll live to be 100. Um, uh, I'll die in 2053. According to the UN, there will be 9.2 billion people on the planet in 2053 if present trends continue. That means in my lifetime, the population of the world will have more than tripled, and more people are going to be born between now and when I die than were here when I arrived. That's crowded. Now, when crowded meets flat, um, you have a world of too many Americans. OK, there are too many. We're going from a world of a billion Americans to a world of two or three billion Americans, people living in American lifestyle. When that happens, if we don't learn to do more things with less stuff, we are going to need three more planets. And that's the dynamic. That's why I called the book Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Great. Mm -hmm. Denise? Bringing up your earlier point, do you see the green movement as a possible way for, Amer for America to recapture its manufacturing base? Oh, absolutely. You know, the thing about green is that it plays actually <coughs> to all our strengths. It requires entrepreneurship, innovation, risk-taking, venture capital. It requires all those quintessentially American things. But we have not created the market for this to take off. Everyone says we need, I say, a Manhattan. We don't need a Manhattan Project. 
We just need a market, you know, a real market. I need, we, need, we don't need 12 guys in Los Alamos trying to invent one thing. We need 10,000 people trying 10,000 things in 10,000 garages. That's what we do. That is quintessentially American. But we're not there yet. We're just there rhetorically. You know, every time people say, come to me say, or I go to things, people say, we're having a green revolution. I say, oh, really? Really? We're having a green revolution? Us? Have you ever been in a revolution where no one got hurt? And that's the green revolution. The green revolution, everyone's a winner. Yeah, Exxon's green, GM's green, put a little yellow cap on the car that says fudge fuel, but they were making it for 10 years, never told anybody. You know, ah, the Green Revolution, everyone's a winner. That's not a revolution. That's a party. <laughs> <laughs> a green party, okay? And it's great fun. I get invited to all the parties, okay? Mm -hmm. And I get invited to a green party every week, mm -hmm. all right? But it has nothing to do with the revolution. If you look at revolution in the dictionary, revolution is when you change one system for another system. And we haven't done that at all. I'll, fin I'll tell you a story. This is welcome to my world. So two, uh, two months ago, there's an Earth Day concert on the mall, mall in Washington, DC. And they call me up and say, would you be the speaker? We're going to have like two or three speakers. I thought, well, that's, how can I say no? Earth Day on the mall. It'll be a concert going along with it, you know, but you'll be you know, there and you'll be a speaker. Okay, I agreed. You know, they pestered me and pestered me. At first, I was a little hesitant. I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. So, um, anyways, unfortunately, my mom died. I came home. It was like right after that, but I couldn't. They had already put me on the thing, so I agreed to do it. I go down. It's two Sundays ago, April, whatever it was, or whenever Earth Day was, the Sunday before. So I go down to the mall, and first of all, it's raining. Biblical storm in Washington, okay? <laughs> Just absolutely, I mean, torrential. But the mall is full, you know, and the band's there, and Chevy Chase is the MC. And so um, uh, there's an actor, Ed Norton. Mm -hmm. um, he was before me, and he goes out and does the rah rah thing, you know, and vote for Obama and Green and blah, blah, blah. So I thought, well, I should really talk about something substantive. So I'll talk about the renewable uh, tax credits that are tied up in Congress and why this group needs to use its leverage to influence that. You know? So I go out and um, I start doing my thing. And I, I sense, ah, maybe this might not be my crowd. And, um, <laughs> and the, the, band, the band starts, the Allman Brothers, they're tuning up while I'm speaking. So at one point I turn around and say, guys, could you just cool it for a second while I talk? <laughs> People start booing. Okay. So if you ever had a moment where you think, Oh, I am so in the wrong place. Okay. <laughs> you know that Southwest commercial, want to get away? Okay. <laughs> and like the hand of God came down, there was a bolt of lightning, and the park <laughs> service called it off in the middle. Bless it. Okay. Chevy Chase came out, got me, said, Tom, we got to stop right now. I said, you know, and I just. So. This is God's truth, exactly what happened. So I get, it's raining, I get off, I'm soaked. I'm, I, they give me a plastic poncho to put on me. I walk to the subway, I'm walking home, my shoes are wet. Mm -hmm. I get in the subway, and I'm sitting there just, you know, thinking, geez, thank God, I just was about mm -hmm. to get the hook, you know. And um, uh, two women are sitting over there, one's read my book, oh, you're top free to read your book. I miss my stop. So we go, I go all the way to the end of the line, okay? I'm repeating all this because I tell the whole story in my book. And then I turn around, the train comes back, now we're going back through the mall, now all the people are at the concert get on the train, okay? And um, so a guy comes up to me, and he said, he's in his late 20s, and he says, he actually heard me speak, I once spoke for his AID contractor, once spoke for his company, and he said, I really appreciated what you were trying to say, and I'm really sorry you couldn't have finished. Um, but a lot of those people were just there for the music. <laughs> yeah. And then he said, did you notice? They left the whole lawn littered. Mm -hmm. We're having a party. <laughs> we're having a party. Tom, I guarantee you, you'll never get the hook in Minnesota. <laughs> 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 Thank you for your wisdom, for your insights, your Appreciate fabulous you. communication. You. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Tom, thank you very, very much for being here. What a fascinating evening. Gene, Gail, thank you for hosting us this evening. We appreciate it.
It was about five years ago. I was in my condo in Maui. I was in my underwear. The phone rang, and it was General Jack Vesey on the phone. Now, I was a general. He's a general. Not all generals are equal. <laughs> so I sat at attention. And he said, you know Gene Sitt? I said, I've met him. I don't know him well, but I've met him. And he said, well, I'd like you to go sit down with him because he has an idea. His idea is to raise several million dollars and distribute it to people so we can show appreciation to the young men and women who are serving in our military. And my immediate response was, well, I would like to raise several million dollars also. I know how difficult that is. And the general told me, yeah, but Gene's going to write the first million dollar check. And with that, I said, now you have my attention. <laughs> and I came home and sat down with Gene Sit. And I've never met a more remarkable person in my life. This is a person who's not only generous, who not only wrote that check, but hit up all of you in this room for checks also. <laughs> when I entered the Air Force right out of college, it was during the middle of Vietnam. That was a controversial war, just as we're involved in right now. But there was one major difference. I was told, don't wear your uniform back home. Because those people who opposed our foreign policy will take it out on the men and women in uniform. You'll be spat upon. You'll be called a baby killer. And it was not a very pleasant time to be a member of the military. And now, fortunately, we've seen about a 180 degree change in that, in that philosophy. In this room, Right now, we have Democrats and we have Republicans. We have some people in this room who totally favor our foreign policy. We have people in this room who totally oppose it. And yet we are all here to show our men and women in uniform that we appreciate what they're doing for us. And that is something that just boggles the mind. One day we had, with Gene Sitt, we had the leading Republican fundraiser in the state of Minnesota in the same room as the leading Democratic fundraiser. One supported our foreign policy in Iraq, one totally opposed it. They were exchanging ideas about how to raise money for the Minnesotans Military Appreciation Fund. Wow. I've been out in Washington. I've had people who have said, gee, you're from Minnesota. Tell us about that program you have going. Tell us how we can do it, because we'd like to do it also. And nobody has. You know, Minnesota does not have a single active duty base in the state, not from any military service. We're not really noted as being a particularly friendly military state. Yet we are leading the nation Thanks to Gene Sitt, and thanks to all of you in this room. We're leading the way. When I talk to the young men and women when they come back home from deployments, and they're gone, these are Guard and Reserve people, and they're gone for a year, a year and a half. It's their first, maybe it's their second, maybe it's their third deployment. And they've had a pretty miserable time. It's been 120 degrees, it's been very dangerous, they've missed a couple of Christmases, they've missed birthdays, they've missed graduations. Sometimes they delayed their own weddings. They come home, their family missed them, their employer is a little ticked off at them because they've been gone from work for so long. And the question that they asked me is, did the people back home appreciate what we were doing? And I can assure you that as a result of Gene Sitt, and those of you in this room who have been so generous, yes, indeed, they know that we do appreciate what they're doing. Whether we agree with the foreign policy or disagree, we appreciate what they are doing. And there are a lot of things you can do. One is every time you see somebody in uniform, walk up and say thank you. You have no idea what an impression that makes. And the second thing you can do is to continue supporting Gene and this appreciation fund. We thank you very much for being here this evening.